Okay, next thing we're going to talk about is transformation. So this is the general form of a sine function, uh, which is referred to as a sinusoid. So f of x is equal to, all right, the number in front of the sine, the coefficient of the sine, that's the amplitude, and then inside those brackets, the number or the coefficient of the x is where we get our period from. And 2 pi over this b variable, b represents the period of the function. So whatever this fraction uh, sort of comes out to be, 2 pi over b, b is the period in that fraction. Okay, on the inside along with x, if you have a, a plus or minus component, that's going to give you a horizontal shift. And then on the outside, or if you have a plus or minus, that would give you a vertical shift. And then just a little note about period. This tends to be very confusing, this 2 pi over the period. So when they ask you to find the period, all you really need to do is you need to take 2 pi, divide it by whatever happens to be the coefficient of x, and that's going to determine the period of the function for you. Okay, so here's one, just like example 4 on page 48. We're going to find the period, the amplitude, the domain, the range, and then we're going to make a graph of this trig function. Okay, so our function is f of x is equal to the cosine of 2x minus pi plus 1. So part A, the period. Okay, what I just said on the last slide was period. All you really need to do is take the normal period of this function, so the normal period of cosine is that 2 pi, divided by the coefficient of x, so 2 pi divided by 2 is going to give us a period of just pi for this function. Okay, part B, the amplitude. Well, the amplitude is the coefficient of the trig function, so amplitude here is 1. See the domain, well it's a cosine function, so domain is all real numbers, so negative infinity to infinity. D, the range, well typically the range uh, is negative 1 to 1, but that can change depending on what you have for an amplitude and if you have a vertical shift. Well we have an amplitude of 1, so that's not going to affect our range, but we do have this vertical shift of up 1, so instead of ranging from negative 1 to positive 1, we're shifting it up 1, which means it's going to have a range of 0 to 2. And then there is a quick graph of that function. All I did was I typed in all of that information on my Inspire, and you can see a quick graph right there of that. Okay, part B, the function is f of x equals negative 2 cosine of 4x. So part A, the period, remember the period is the normal period of cosine, which is 2 pi, divided by the coefficient of x. So 2 pi over 4 is going to give us a period of pi over 2. Uh, B, the amplitude, that's determined by the coefficient of the trig function. So negative 2 was out, out front there. So that means we have an amplitude of 2. We don't really say that the amplitude is negative. Uh, that negative is just going to kind of invert your function. Uh, part C, the domain, um, again it's a cosine, so all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. And then uh, our range, we have an amplitude of 2, so instead of going from negative 1 to 1, our range is going to go from negative 2 to 2. And here is our graph, so you can see uh, our graph has gotten taller because of that amplitude. It's also sort of squished together because the period now, instead of we're usually seeing it stretched out over a period of 2 pi to complete itself, now it's completing itself in only pi over 2. So that's why uh, it seems to be squished together. Okay, here's a thinker question. Which trig functions have an inverse? And remember that to have an inverse, they need to be one-to-one. -one. Well, if we think back to those graphs, none of the trig functions have an inverse on their entire domain. However, we can generate an inverse if we restrict the domain. 
So this is example six on page 50. Show that the graph y is equal to sine of x uh, for the domain of negative pi over two to pi over two has an inverse. So we're gonna graph this and we're gonna graph it parametrically. So remember to graph the original function parametrically. First we let the x value equal t and the y value equal the function. So x is t and y is sine of t and that's gonna be our t interval. And then the inverse function simply switches those two around. So for x2, we let that be sine of t, and y2 is t. And then to graph the line y equals x, we graph x is equal to t and y is equal to t. So there's a graph of the original function of when x is equal to t and y is equal to the sine of t from our domain of negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Next, we have the, uh, the graph of the inverse when x is the sine of t and y is equal to t. And then here we have a graph of both of them together with the line y equals x. And we can see that yes, that we do indeed have the inverse because we have the mirror image across that line y is equal to x. And then inverse graphs you can find on page 51 of your textbook uh, to see more graphs of the other trig functions. Okay, and here's just a table. This is These are definitions. Uh, inverse trig functions denoted by the negative one sign like we typically do for inverses, a list of their domains and their ranges. Um, this is not something I would expect you to commit to memory, so uh, don't feel like you have to write this all down. Um, and this chart you can also find on page 50 and 51 of your book uh, that you can refer to at any time that you might need it. Okay, using the inverse trig functions. This is example 8 on page 51. We're looking to solve each of these for x. And we're going to find the measure of the angle in radians. Okay, so our first equation for part a, sine of x is equal to 0.7 and we're looking in the interval of 0 to 2 pi. So anywhere one trip all the way around the coordinate plane. Okay, so if I'm trying to find x, and I know that the sine of x is 0.7, to solve for x, I'm going to take the inverse sine of each side. So the inverse sine of 0.7 is equal to approximately 0.775. So what that means is if the inverse of the sine is positive, that's going to happen. Let's see, where is the sine positive? Well, we are getting a value of this 0.775. So that's the first place. I'm just going to sort of draw this in. Again, disclaimer, not, not drawn to scale. So here is our 0.775. Again, trying to draw with the mouse. Not as easy as it looks. So there, let me get a decimal point. You can actually see 0.775. And then the sine is also positive in quadrant two. Remember, all of them here, and sine and cosecant over here. So that means that this one, this radius, or this hypotenuse of our triangle, would be right here also, and the measurement between this line here and that hypotenuse is also 0.775. So to calculate the actual angle measure here in terms of radians, well, this one is 0.775 because that's simply what we got when we calculated it. Over here, we know that this 0.775 means that this angle goes from here all the way over here and there is 0.775 radians in between pi and our actual angle. So pi minus the 0.775 gives us our second angle of 2.366. So here's the first one and then here's the second one. Let me grab a different color. This would be the measurement of the second angle. So here you can see in red 0.775 radians, and then this one is pi minus 0.775 radians, 
or 2.366 radians. Okay, part B here. Now we're looking for where is the tangent of x, negative 2, and we're trying to find out what x value lets that happen. So we're going to take the inverse tangent of negative 2, and we're going to get that inverse tangent of negative 2 is negative 1.107. So I'm going to erase our stuff here so we can talk about the tangent. Okay, negative 1.107. So that means if we started here, negative means we're going to be going counterclockwise here. So let me draw that in. And that's 1.107. So we have a negative uh, tangent value. So that happens here. It also happens, everything is positive here, sine and cosecant is positive here, so that's also going to happen up here. So 1.107 there as well. And we happen to be now, our interval is negative infinity to infinity. So we can keep going around and around and around and around forever. So the way we're going to kind of write this is we're going to take this negative 1.107 guy. Oops, and I forgot my negative there. And what we're going to do is we're going to add k pi to it which really means we're going to take our intervals of pi and we're subtracting this 1.107 because this angle right here, this negative 1.107, that's the same as 2 pi subtract this 1.107 and over here this 1.107 that's the same as going all the way to here, all the way to pi and then subtracting off that piece so we're going to subtract that 1.107 off of any interval of pi. And uh, the reason we have to use k pi is that represents any, any integer value of pi. So we could add 1 pi, we could add 2 pi, we could add 3 pi, we could add 8,000 pi. Uh, but any integer value of pi, if we subtract that 1.107, is going to put us either here or here, and that's where the tangent would equal negative 2 from this huge uh, infinite interval of negative infinity to infinity. Okay, moving on, finishes up our section. Your homework is on page 52, numbers 1 to 39, the odds, skipping question number 23. Um, again, remember to put this in your homework notebook, not this regular notebook. And as always, please let me know if you have questions. If you want to check in, uh, send me an email. And I will be happy to assist you. But this finishes up your AP review. Uh, congratulations. Good job. I appreciate your hard work. And you're going to appreciate your hard work, too, as we move into our topics uh, throughout the school year. Getting this chapter one information out of the way is going to allow us more time to concentrate on content for the exam, and I think you're really going to appreciate having the extra time during the school year to do that. So I will see you at the very beginning of September, and I will see you in email before then if you have any questions.